we should be good to go. So, we're in a new section. Uh, separation of variables. And even though it's only the second week of the semester, this is going to basically be it as far as the sort of general solution technique go. We'll learn how to solve linear equations. Again, that's as a tool to study non-linear equations. But um, this is basically as far as I want to go with solution techniques. And maybe I should say a word about that, because I mean, if you open a differential equations textbook, you're going to find all sorts of solution techniques. And it's like, well, why am I not teaching you them? And I'm not teaching you them because they never work in any kind of applied or real world setting. And that's fine. Um, I mean, I think there is beauty in pure mathematics, but it's not really what I want from a differential equations course. I want to try to get at how this material is actually used. But separation of variables shows up in some very elementary applications. This is good to go over. So, say that you have the following, um, dy dx equals negative 6xy. What is stopping us from solving this using integration? like we did in the class on Thursday. If you integrate both sides, the fundamental theorem of calculus does just give you a y on the left. On the right, we get, let me give myself slightly more space to work with, on the right, we get this integral, negative 6xy dx. And the issue here, I mean, if you've taken calculus 3, any integration involving more than two variables is no picnic. And in this case, it's just, I mean, it can't be done. I mean, you cannot find this integral if you have no idea what y is. And we don't have any idea of what y is. That's precisely what we're trying to solve by integration. So it's because you have that y on the right-hand side that separation of um, that integration doesn't work. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, when you run into this situation, you can use a technique called separation of variables. And the trick to separation of variables, if you want to call it that, is to treat dy dx. I mean, our variables might be called something else. I'm just going to use y and x here. To treat dy dx as a fraction. 
It's kind of funny, in count of this, we always say, well, this is, you know, notation for the derivative. It looks like a fraction, but it's not really a fraction, and you can't treat it like a fraction. And then we spend basically all of count to this one, like the chain rule. Whole, um, parametric differentiation. There are all these rules that work really nicely if you ignore that advice and just treat dy dx as if it were a fraction. And we're going to see the same thing here. We're not supposed to do this. We're supposed to think of dy dx as just being the notation for the derivative. But if we treat dy dx as a fraction, and we get all the x's on one side of the equality, and all the y's on the other side of the equality, then we can use integration to solve, or at least to study, the differential equation. And this is something that, that probably looks like gibberish without a, an example. So let's go ahead and proceed with dy dx equals negative 6xy. And what I mean when I say we're going to treat dy dx as a fraction is that we're going to take this dx and we are going to bring it over to the right hand side just as if we were multiplying by the denominator of a fraction. And then we can divide both sides by y. And we get 1 over y dy equals negative 6x dx. And if now we integrate both sides, or add an integral sign to both sides, um, we may or may not remember all of these integrals from calculus. But the integral of 1 over y dy is the natural log of the absolute value of y. And then we've got a constant of integration. And the integral of negative 6x dx is negative 3 x squared, and we've got a constant of integration. And now we can try to solve for y. So we have just y's and x's now. Our derivatives have gone away. We can try to solve for y algebraic. I should say. So 
the natural log of the absolute value of y equals. Um, plus c, let's not get rid of that constant of integration just yet. Plus c equals negative 3x squared plus d. And our goal is to solve for y, just algebraically. Um, if we want y by itself, we can subtract c from both sides. And now we're going to say, okay, d is a completely arbitrary constant. c is a complete the arbitrary constant. One completely arbitrary constant minus another completely arbitrary constant is still a completely arbitrary constant. Let's just call it E. Um, and now this is always kind of tricky, like Theoretically, we learn to do this early in college algebra, but it's something a lot of people forget, I think. If we want to get rid of a logarithm, we take the exponential of both sides. So, I mean, the alternative notation, I'm taking e to the negative 3x squared plus e, and on the left, I'm taking e to the natural log. And the exponential and the natural log are inverses. They cancel each other out. We get the absolute value of y equals this exponential, e to the negative 3x squared plus e. There's no, we've never learned algebraic how to get rid of an absolute value sign. But let's, let's think about this a little. Um, let's go over here. The absolute value of y is either positive y or negative y. If y is positive, the absolute value doesn't do anything. If y is negative, the absolute value throws a negative sign onto it. So we've basically got plus or minus y equals this exponent. And now we are running out of space. I'm going to take this and move it to the next frame. This is, I am now realizing, pretty elaborate for a first example, but we've committed to it now. Meanwhile, e to the negative 3x squared plus e can be rewritten as Euler's constant e raised to the capital E 
times Euler's constant E raised to the negative 3x squared. What we have here is a positive constant. So just like, just like here where we took d minus c and we just gave it a name, we called it e. Let's call this Um, K. Let's multiply, and we've got this positive or negative sign here. Let's take the positive and negative sign and move it to the right. If k is an arbitrary positive constant, then plus or minus k is just an arbitrary constant. Could be positive, could be negative. So, oof. Again, I don't think I appreciate it. <laughs> just how many steps this would take, and just how ugly that simplification would be. But we made it in the end, and we think that y is an arbitrary constant times e to the negative 3x squared. So we've solved for y somehow. I mean, there's this kind of, I'm probably not going to talk about this in class. It's in my notes if anyone is really interested. I mean, the mechanics behind this, dy dx isn't really a fraction. So clearly, we're doing something funny here. But again, I don't really want to go into that. This is how separation of variables works. Treat dy dx as a fraction, multiply that dx over to the right, get all of the y's over to the left, and then integrate. Let's do an easier example. Um, again, I think we might have started off a little a little uh, hard there. dy dx equals k times y. This is an example I gave on the board in our very first day. I said that it shows up a lot in application, um, you know, for the spread of a population, for the spread of a rumor, for the spread of disease. Um, so this is a simple exp um a simple differential equation, but it is an important one that shows up in applications, and it would certainly be nice to be able to solve it. And we cannot use integration. I mean, we cannot just use the techniques that we talked about last Thursday, because we don't have x's on the right, we have our variable, we have y. So let's do separation of variables here. Let's get the y's together, let's get the x's together. Multiply both sides 
by dx, divide both sides by y, I mean, I guess this isn't going to be that much simpler than the example we just did. Now we have our y's together on the left and our x's on the right. And we throw in some integration. we still get this kind of ugly term that absolute value is never going to stop being a hassle. On the right, the integral of k is k times x. And we've got a constant of integration. Every time we use separation of variables, we'll get a constant of integration on the left and a constant of integration on the right, and then those will combine into a single constant of integration on the right. So you see it's pretty normal to just not bother writing down the constant of integration on the left, you see that here. Same thing we did last problem. Take the exponential of both sides. On the left, exponentials cancel. On the right, we rewrite the exponential. Addition turns into multiplication. Just like we did in the previous example, this plus or minus, I mean, this e to the c is a positive constant. The exponential of any number is positive. So we have plus or minus y equals e to the c. We take that plus or minus and we absorb it into e to the c. And now e to the c can be positive or negative. And we are giving it a new name. We're calling it A. So, this differential equation represents exponential growth, um, which we know from previous classes. Exponential growth is extremely fast, so this is representing extremely fast growth, assuming that k is a positive constant. Um, that's the idea of separation of variables. You cannot always use just like integration, this is not some one-size-fits-all, solve every differential equation technique. And it, I mean, it's very easy to write down uh, differential equations. Y plus the sine 
of x times y, y prime plus the sine of x times y equals zero. Um, you're never going to be able to solve this using separation of variables because you're never going to be able to separate your variables. Um, the x and the y are stuck together inside of that sign. And nothing you do is going to allow you to take the x's to one side and the y's to the other. So, um, separation of variables, really like all differential equation solution techniques, is specialized. It works on a relatively small handful of differential equations. But the reason I teach it and not other solution techniques is that that small handful includes some very important differential equations. Like this is a very important differential equation. You should be able to solve Separation of variables also runs into practical problems a lot of the time, like, oh, dy dx equals the tangent cubed of x times the natural log of y. This is separable. When I say that a differential equation is separable, I mean we can get the x's and the y's by themselves. So, I mean, this is one divided by the natural log of y equals the tangent cubed x dx. And don't let me get sloppy. We have a dy on the left-hand side. So, We've successfully, I mean, we've successfully separated our variables. Is this, I mean, I'm sort of assuming everyone here is a math major, but we divided both sides by the natural log of y to bring it over. Then we multiplied both sides by dx to bring it over. So we just did those two pieces of algebra. And now we can throw our integral signs in, but this is as far as we go, at least if we're working by hand. We, um, we could look up in our Calculus 2 textbook how to integrate the tangent cubed, but as far as integrating one over the natural log of y, I don't know how to do that, and I suspect that there isn't any way to do it. I mean, working by hand. So we separated our variables, but the end result was just an integral that we cannot take. So we sort of we sort of kicked the can down the road a bit, but if we want a solution to this, we're going to have to use computer software. There's no way around that. You're either using computer software 
to estimate this solution, or you're using computer software to find that integral. It's just, it's one or the other. Another feature of differential equations that you solve using separation of variables is that even if you can take the integral, you might not be able to solve for y. So, definition. An implicit solution to an ODE, ordinary differential equation, remember, is one where your variables are mixed together. Obviously not the world's most formal definition, the way I've stated it. You could tighten it up by saying that we have some function of x and y on the left, and then on the right you have is zero. Implicit solutions are still good. Like you can go to, assuming you just have two variables, you can go to desmos.com and ran an implicit solution. So it's not a terrible thing to have these. It's just something to be aware of. Like, so for example, dx dt, that's for just sort of for variety, we can change our variable here. dx dt equals 4 minus 2t over 3x squared minus... Actually, sorry, I know it's very easy for me to erase stuff. More inconvenient for you. I'm going to want to graph this on Desmos. Desmos is probably going to hate it if I use x and t for my variables. So, to make life easier for me down the road, Let's use variables that Desmos will not object to. Let's use y and x. Well, this is separable. We can get our y's together and we can get our x's together. Um, Deciding whether a differential equation is separable is really sort of you look at it and you think a bit. In this case, if you multiply both sides of this equality by the denominator of this fraction, you'll get 3y squared minus 5, and that dy on the left. And if you multiply both sides of this differential equation by dx, you'll get 4 minus 2x times dx on the right. And your x's and your y's have been separated. 
and we can integrate. And actually, up to a point, um, this, this example is much nicer than the two examples I've already done because you don't have that ugly natural logarithm, you don't have that ugly absolute value, y cubed minus 5y equals 4x minus x squared plus a constant of integration. And there's no way to solve for y here. There's no way to write this so that on the left, it's y equals, and on the right, it's just x's. So this is implicit. Um, if you compare it to what I have written over here, I mean, you could write y cubed minus 5y minus 4x plus x squared minus c equals 0. So a lot of textbooks and a lot of, sorry, my leg's kind of bothering me, a lot of textbooks and a lot of online resources have implicit solutions defined this way, something equal to zero. And that's not really saying anything special. You can take any equality, subtract the right-hand side over to the left-hand side, and then you'll just have zero on the right-hand side. So this zero is just not, I mean, it's not um, really doing anything special. So this is an example of an implicit solution, and your calculator won't be able to do anything with this, but any sort of more powerful graphing utility will. Like I said, the Desmos will. And let's talk about this a bit, because the graph that we are going to get from Desmos is going to be correct, but also potentially misleading in some way. So let me go to desmos.com. And let me see. Y cubed minus five Y Desmos will not care even slightly if you enter that versus entering that. Let's say equals 4x minus x squared. Plus, and now Desmos is going to object. What C? And we can turn C into a slider, and we can look at what different constants of integration do. Like if C is 1, then our solution curve looks like this. If C is bigger, it kind of widens out. If C looks like a round point three point something. Eventually, as C decreases, this splits into two pieces. And I'm eventually that vanishes. 
So that constant of integration C is quite important. It's having a significant impact on what this graph looks like. With that in mind, let's take Another look, I'm going to copy down the exact same differential equation we were just looking at. And let's give, first of all, let's give x some kind of this will be easier to talk about if we think of x as being a time variable. And let's throw an initial condition onto the board. So let's go from a differential equation to an initial value problem. And let's copy down our solution. y cubed minus 5y equals 4x minus x squared plus c. And this initial condition is telling us when x equals 0, y equals 0. So this allows us to solve for c. If x and y are both 0, this equation turns in to 0 equals c. So from the initial value problem, we find that c is 0. And we go back and we'll take another look at this on Desmos with C equal to zero. So we have this graph and at time zero, we are here. Um, so what happens as time passes? Remember that time is our x value here. So saying that time passes just means we're going to the right on this curve. Well, as time passes, we go to the right. And you see, as t x increases, as time passes, y changes. Now well, eventually, time passes, time passes. Eventually, we get to 4.822. Let's say 4.822 seconds. What happens here? And I mean, the answer is that is that we're done, as it were. Time cannot increase past 4.882. It's true that there are values of, it's true that if you look at the graph, we see this curve down here, but y is not going to jump discontinuously from up here 
to down here. So even though we have this part of the graph, our initial value stops us from ever being there. Time passes, time passes, until we reach our maximum x value on this chunk, and then time stops. If we think of time as being negative, the same thing happens. Time can only go so far to the left before we reach the leftmost value on this upper piece, and we have to stop. So this initial condition, what did I just do? This initial condition, is giving us restrictions on x. It's saying that time can only go this far in the negative direction and this far in the positive direction. And likewise, it's giving us restrictions on y. If we only go this far in the negative direction, and we only go this far in the positive direction, we never get up here. Like, there's no way to reach this point. Because as time passes, after 2.151 seconds, y isn't up here. After 2.151 seconds, y is around here. It's down here. So y can never actually get to these values up here. Likewise, we have this graph down here, but we never jump from piece to piece. So y is, oh, what is this? This is negative 1. Let's say that should get rid of it. So here is the part of the graph that we can actually get to. That's really relevant if y of 0 equals 0. And this is something that happened. I don't like that expression. Is there anything unclear about this? Any well, questions? Just processing it, that's all. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> nope, no, I uh, don't, it doesn't bother me. I'd like yeah. people to let me know if they're confused. Um, so this happens very frequently when we have implicit solutions and we graph them. We graph the implicit solution, we get this whole thing, but actually we're stuck on this relatively limited piece of the graph. So this is something, I mean, something to be aware of. It's not going to keep coming up in the class, but it's certainly something to know. not want to do that. One last thing that I want to say is that separation of variables can lose 
solutions. And again, this isn't something you have to, you know, constantly stress about. Um, the solutions we lose tend not to be very interesting, but it's just something to be aware of. And I'm going to illustrate this via an example dy dx equals 6x times y minus 1 to the 2 thirds power. This is separable. We can get y's on the left, x's on the right. 1 over y minus 1 to the 2 thirds power dy equals 6x dx. And now we'll throw those negative signs there, I mean those integral signs, and we integrate. So y minus 1 to the 2 thirds in the denominator, that's y minus 1 to the negative 2 thirds On the right, 6x dx. So, integrate. Uh, this is, this is uh, math 151 on the left. Um, you can always, like, talk to me in my office hours if you're struggling with the calculus. We're going to be done with calculus basically after next week. So if this is your least favorite thing, it's not going to stick around forever. But, I mean, this is a U substitution. It ends up being that on the left. Bump the negative two-thirds up. On the right, uh, 3x squared plus a constant of integration. Let's see, does this look right to everyone? Then we can divide both sides by 3. An arbitrary constant divided by 3 is still an arbitrary constant. We can cube both sides. And we can add one to both sides. So here is our solution, the solution that we got using 
separation of variables. Um, notice that x squared plus c is, well, never mind. Let's just go to go to what I said here about losing a solution. Um, so C can be a constant, but this, I mean, this solution is always going to have x squared in it, like x squared plus 3 cubed, or x squared minus 7 cubed. I mean, that x squared always exists in the solution. Well, there's another solution a simpler solution to this differential equation, and that is the constant function y equals 1. So this is a solution. If we plug y equals 1 in here, on the left, the derivative of a constant function is zero. On the right, one minus one is always zero. Raised to the two thirds power is zero. Zero times six x is zero. So there is a solution. And going back to what I said earlier, that the solutions we lose tend not to be very interesting. I mean, it's, it's just a constant. But, but it is a solution. And what happened here was that to do separation of variables, we had to divide by this. Well, we're not allowed to divide by zero. So when we divided by y minus one, we were sort of implicitly assuming that y minus one couldn't be zero, so y couldn't be one. And um, that step where we divided, and as part of the division, we had to assume that we weren't dividing by zero. That was the moment that we lost this initial condition. So what we have here where we have this constant of integration, and it's an infinite class of solutions. What we have on this frame is called the general solution. I'm trying to, sorry, I, I know I'm, trying to think. Um, I am completely blanking on it because this is maybe the only time in the course it will come up. When you have these, um, you have these general solutions with your constants of integration, and I am unfortunately blanking on what you call these sort of weird exceptional solutions. I can look it up in, and uh, have it for you by, uh, by Thursday, but occasionally you have these non-general solutions. And as I say, usually they're not very interesting. Like a lot of the times they're constant. You, um, 
you've actually run into this in your homework. Um, there was that one of those velocity problems where it was like, can you solve some initial condition? Like y of zero equals zero or something, and you couldn't. And the reason for that was that you were given the general solution, but for that one initial condition, you needed a specific non-general solution. So they do occasionally show up. As I say, in this class, we're not really super interested in solving these low order differential equations. Um, by the end of next week, we'll, I think, pretty much be done with this. But for now, this is all good stuff. And um, what do we have? Uh, we have a few application sections next. We'll look at a few famous population models tomorrow, not tomorrow, but Thursday, and then Wednesday, Tuesday of next week, we'll look at motion without air resistance or with air resistance. Once again, we'll be solving those equations using separation of variables, and then we'll be moving on to diff very different materials. And I will see all of you uh, on Thursday.